know, I suppose I'd like to share with you for a few minutes this time. It's basically in regards to uh, changing ourselves. Sometimes we look at ourselves and we see areas that we'd like to have changed. And uh, even though we may think our prayer is, is legitimate in that it's requesting a change in ourselves, it's still a direction to God to do what we want him to do, change us in a particular area. And I, I think we should caution ourselves against that. It's actually making plans for God. It's telling him what to do, even though it may be in regards to ourselves. But um, i found that one of the things I'm interested in is is changing my ideas, my my thoughts about um, situations, for instance. You may look at a situation and, and not see it for what it really is because you have preconceived ideas or old habits or old genetic tendencies. And sometimes the changes that we need are, are perceptual changes, looking at, at a situation with a fresh new approach or seeing it from from God's point of view instead of instead of yours. So the changes that we can expect in ourselves could be all kinds of things. And they might be something we would never even pray for, never even expect, never even ask for. But through real deep faith we should almost pray a prayer of Lord change me in ways that I don't even know anything about. I haven't even grasped this picture yet, um, but I'm willing. I'm willing to have you show me what might need to be changed or or help me look at, at this situation a little differently than I have been. I think of, of family situations in your home with children and spouses, and you've looked at it this way for so many years, and, and maybe you need a change, a new, a new vision. So, as we mentioned, the change may not be in sin in our lives. It may be in these other areas. I just kind of wanted to share that with you. Yes, Kimber? Uh, in the beginning, you said that uh, perhaps we shouldn't even tell God what we'd like Him to change and such. But yet, if uh, we've been asking the Holy Spirit to dwell within us and lead us in the path of righteousness, then it's the Holy Spirit that's going to show us what we need to ask yes. God to change. So if we don't ask God for that very thing, then, then we're supporting the work of God, not furthering it. And I think that's, that's a real possibility. We, um, if it's been brought to our conscious awareness, perhaps it's been placed there by the Spirit of God, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a real, a real concern we need to look at. Um, but sometimes I think we have in our own idea our own ideas of what we need to be, how we need to be changed. But again, it's a level of faith experience in, in our own lives to know maybe, again, we should ask for discernment to know which is, which is really from God's spirit, which it might be from our own imaginations. But you're right. I do think God's spirit brings things to our conscious level, our conscious mind, that we need to be changed some areas, and we should pursue that route, and we should engage in, in this kind of prayer that is just unrelenting, where we just beg and plead and keep going back again and again and ask for this change to occur. Thank you, Nice to have all these places to be a bunch of guests that have already been rolled during this camp meeting. I want to go back to the story of David and Ziklag a moment. To pick up an important point there in regards to enforcement and prayer. As you recall, David was trapped in the game down the fight against his own people, the Israelites. If we go back to the second, first Kings, I think it is, chapter 13 or thereabouts. And uh, God delivered him in the most remarkable fashion from the. Um, situation in which he found himself. Uh, and um, when he came back, he found that uh, 
Ziklag had been destroyed, his wives taken captive and his children, and also all his flocks and herds, all his possessions were gone. That's the first Samuel, I think. I had a bit of a surprise after that. Yes, first Samuel. First Samuel chapter 30. And the story is here told of how David came back and uh, found his city destroyed, his wife taken captive and things in a very sorry state. And all of David's men rose up with a bitter word of complaint and murmuring against God and against David to almost killed him by taking up stones and destroying him. But we find that uh, David took a different attitude from the rest of the people now. David did not instantly go before God and place his request before God. But first of all, he strengthened himself in God. Verse 6. The last part says, But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. I think the old King James says, Encouraged himself, does it? Does that? Yes. Right. No, I like that very much. It's the most helpful. Because David seemed to recognize the fact that according to his faith, it would be under him. He knew the larger faith he presently had even though he just enjoyed a great victory over the situation in going to the Philistines Philistine to fight against his own people. And coming back from that victory of faith, because that's certainly what it was, he now finds himself in need of another victory, but first of all, he strengthens himself in the Lord. No, <coughs> he increased his capacity to receive the blessings of God. Is that right? He strengthened himself, he increased his capacity. Now go back a moment to the victory game just prior to this point of time when David was obliged to, to march with King Achish down against his own people. Now, David prayed about that matter. He repented of his sin in going to Achish in the first place. And God began to work for him, which took several days to accomplish. And each of those days, David had to march without seeing God work, but just hanging on by faith until victory finally came. And once again, that that symbolized that meant a certain capacity on his part. Now, having gained that victory by faith, he comes to this next need, which requires even greater faith. So, firstly, he strengthens he strengthens himself in the Lord. Is that wonderful? Wonderful lesson. And we'd be less hasty about placing a request before God, and more concerned about taking the capacity to receive the blessing. We do gain great victories, even as David did. Now. David then went before God and asked the question through the, through the uh, high priest, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? Verse 8. And he answered him, Pursue for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. Now, I'd like to just uh, add some thoughts in regard to this victory which David gained at this point in time, because it does look as if God is a participant in the work of killing the Amalekites. The story goes that David goes after them and finds this, this uh, exhausted Egyptian who, on the promise of his own safety, takes them to the encampment of the Malachites. David falls upon them suddenly and unexpectedly and takes them from twilight, twilight until the evening of the next day. So all night and all day he fought. What, what endurance, what strength those men must have had to fight for 24 hours straight, killing, killing, killing during that period of time. And then recovering all they had, uh, they had lost in the attack by the Amalekites. Now, in what way could God uh, participate in this battle? And what a victory uh, David gained—a supernatural victory for sure. Because how many of his men were killed? No. None. Wounded? No. None. That's amazing, isn't it? Six hundred men against several thousand—not even a scratch to David's forces. Does this mean that God participated in some way? Right, in some way. It had to be. And I believe that while God did not participate in the actual killing process, nor, nor, but, but he gave them protection from the enemies, and they were able to fight them over that particular cloud without being wounded or, or killed in any way whatsoever. But the main thing I wish to pass on to you at this point is this, that David strengthened himself in the Lord increased his capacity and on that basis went forth and gained the victory of the Amalekites. Now, this disposition on the part of man to 
work on God and change God is very prevalent. And the more we realize how prevalent it is, the more we see its danger and we're more prepared to avoid it in our own experience. Let's go back to the story I mentioned toward the end of our last to get together, the story of the nobleman who came from Capernaum, John the fourth chapter. Let's turn back there in a little bit more detail at this point of time. Because it's a very important uh, revelation of the disposition of man's part to try to change God. It's a futile effort, mind you, it's a waste of time and energy, so don't try anymore. Let's turn back to the inflexibility of Christ, he would never change or try and change his father, nor would he allow him to change him either. John, the fourth chapter. And down toward the end of the uh, chapter, we find this, this message or this, this experience. So I'd like to read me, please, John chapter 4, verse 46 to the end of the chapter. Somebody, please. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick of Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was on the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. <coughs> Excuse me. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour that he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour at which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed in his whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did. He came out of Judea and Galilee. Thank you very much. Uh, I love this story very, very much. I, 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 many years and I think it's a great lesson in regard to successful prayer <laughs> and the necessity for our coming to God in the right way for the right thing. Now first of all, this man had never before met Jesus Christ had he? He'd heard about him by the reports and testimonies of others. Now can you build a faith or at least some faith on the witness of another person? Certainly, again. Certainly, right? And it's one of, the, one of the important factors that God uses to build faith in people. As we said in our last study period, Christ, because he was the embodiment of God's word and the power of God was in him, did generate faith in those he came in contact with. And there's one story in which that point is made very, very clear and very plain, as we looked at this morning. So this man then had a measure of faith, and therefore certain a certain capacity to receive the gift of God, which was a very low and very minimal capacity at that point of time. And based on the reports of others, he had built a certain concept of what to expect when he saw Jesus Christ. Now bear in mind that uh, mankind equates power with authority, with uh, display, with arm bites, and so forth. And therefore, this man expected, expected to meet Jesus Christ and see him as a man dressed in fine clothes with a bodyguard of soldiers, no doubt. A man of great personal power and strength. But when he found him, he found a man plainly dressed, dusty and travel stained and travel worn. And what happened to that man's faith in when when this reality placed him? Plummeted. What? Plummeted. Plummeted, right. He, he lost his grip on the faith at that point in time. Now on page 197 I read these words, He hoped that a father's prayers might awaken the sympathy of the great physician. So what was he hoping for? Hoping for a change in Jesus Christ, wasn't he? Right. And what revelation is this to us today of the tendency on our part to do the same thing. He hoped that a father's prayers might awaken the sympathy of the great physician. Absolutely, absolutely, because can you awaken Christ to believe? Why not? Because it's there. <laughs> it's all right away. That's right. It's wide awake all it's the time. Dead. It's continually awake. 
And uh, Christ's sympathy for the human family, of course, is infinite. You can't change it or increase it or modify it. It's already infinite. So therefore, this prayer had to fail, didn't it? It was based on the wrong foundation. And I can assure you today, from my experience, the word of God, that if you approach God with the idea of changing Him, your prayer is going to fail. And fail, and fail, and fail forever. Unless you change yourself and your prayers and your approach to God. And that's a very important truth that I do believe we need to grasp and lay hold upon. That any person that comes to God with the idea of changing God, waking his sympathy, changing his mind, breaking him down, um, or whatever it might happen to be, that prayer is certain to fail. Certain. There's nothing more sure. So, um, the, the interesting thing is this, that even though that prayer is going to fail, we still pray that prayer. And this man from Capernaum nevertheless said to Jesus Christ, come down and heal my son. Uh, Again, come down to my son. So, despite the fact that the prayer is based upon wrong principles, he still prayed that prayer, didn't he? We've done the same. We prayed, and prayed, and prayed, and prayed, and prayed for days, and weeks, and years. Sometimes, always repeating the same mistake over and over again, wondering why God never hears and replies to our request. So, this man told Christ his errand and asked him to come to his home to heal his son. Uh, but, the man, but Christ already knew about the man's problem and uh, behold his affliction. At the same time, Christ recognized the false approach of this man, the unbelieving approach of this man, because the man was literally saying to himself, if Christ heals my son, then I shall believe. You ever found yourself with your lips in your approach to God? I'm sure, I'm sure we all have it, we? We say, now mind that if God does this, if he fulfills a promise, I'll believe in him and do what he wants to do. I've done it, I confess it, all too, all too often. We have to fight against that tendency on our part because it's a very dangerous one, so the least of it. So as I read in page 198, but he knew also that the Father had his own mind made conditions concerning his belief in Christ or in Jesus. Unless his condition should be granted, we would not receive him as the Messiah. While the others went in the negative suspense, Jesus said, Except you see Simon, whether you shall not believe. Now, that man then came to Christ, he came to the right person, asking for the right thing, but in the wrong way. And therefore Christ says to him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. In other words, Christ said, You are basing your faith upon what you see upon what you receive, not upon the word. The one that must be the uh, faith in place. The word. Upon the word of God. Now ask yourself the question, have you ever come to the place where you where you doubted God's word that wasn't fulfilled to you? Were you ever said in your heart, God does not keep his promises? Do you honestly say that you were still here? I have said it, I'm, I must confess it again, I find I have to fight against the tendency to what does this happen? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, in fact, I've even found myself tempted to believe that God doesn't care. That God is, uh, that God is unconcerned. God is, God is not touched by our woes and wants and needs and so forth. But um, what happens is this, that when, when we come to God, our mind's bent upon changing Him to do for us what we, what we think He should do for us, and God doesn't do it, we get nothing in response to that kind of prayer. Then we say, then we, then we start to doubt the word of God and to feel that God doesn't hear, doesn't care even, doesn't even worry about our sense that any upon this earth. But the facts are, of course, that God does care. His promises are absolutely sound and reliable, and that we've fulfilled His own time of life. And I would say right now that uh, it's extremely vital for the success of our approach to God to believe that God's promises mean exactly what they say and will be fulfilled as exactly as that so if we come to God in the right way. Nothing more certain than that. Now think about it. In the Bible and spirit of prophecy, God has committed himself to certain great uh, responsibilities or certain great promises and uh, assurances, right? Now, 
We didn't ask him to, did we? Why did he do it? Because he loves us. Because he wants to save us. He wants to heal us. He wants to do these great things for us. He wants to do it. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 3. Right? This is the will of God, even your sanctification. Now, having gone on record in, in clear black and white print, if God should fail to keep one promise to the life of all his creatures, what about his kingdom? It will fall. It will fall. So therefore, when you go before God <clears throat> in the right way, claim one of his promises, lay hold upon the grasp for yourself, if God should elect not to fulfill that promise to you when you fulfill the conditions necessary, then God is a liar, he's unfaithful, he's unreliable, and an unreliable God is not a perfect problem solver. And therefore, his whole kingdom must fall apart if he should make a promise which he doesn't fulfill. Now, if I was asked you for an division today, I'm sure to answer this question all in the same manner. We've all experienced God's promises being fulfilled to us. I mean, some promises. But we've all experienced that. We've all experienced too, some promises not being fulfilled or seemingly not being fulfilled, haven't we? I certainly have. I've had to battle sometimes for weeks and weeks and weeks to get the victory over that feeling that uh, God has failed me sometimes in the past. But I find this tarrying time is a time of real struggle and mighty education in this very point, which is so essential to our future welfare. So when God says, I am the Lord, your doctor, for instance, does that mean what he said? That's what it says? Absolutely. I heal all your diseases. Does that mean what it says? Right. If we find ourselves not being healed of our diseases, where does the fault lie? ourselves every single time and then of course we need to begin to search our hearts examine ourselves about why that thing has not been fulfilled to us as God has promised so when Christ said to this man except you see signs and wonders you will not believe that word of Christ to that man was a word of power a penetrating revealing exposing word of power and also a promising word of power. A word of power full of promises. Let's go a little further down to uh, page 198. I'll read first of all, yet the nobleman had a degree of faith where he come to ask for sing to him the most precious of all blessings. He had a degree of faith. I do want to impress upon your minds again this morning the point that there are levels of capacity to receive, right? In the leper, first of all, he hoped. Well, first of all, faith began to spring up. Remember the words? Faith began to spring up. Then he hoped. Then his faith grew stronger. So there was an increasing level of faith in that man as he, as he climbed higher and higher in the spiritual, spiritual progress. And this no one likewise had a degree of flavor for him to save in the first case. Now, let's look now at the power of the word. Like a flash of light, the Saviour's word to the nobleman laid bare his heart. Like a flash of light, it laid bare his heart. Is that a word of power? A wonderful word of power, an effective word of power, to say the least of it. He saw that his motives in seeking Jesus were selfish. Now, one thing we should treasure and uh, desire is that the Spirit of God shall reveal sin to us as a sin really is. Right? In that instant of time, the Saviour's words to the ministry of the Spirit showed that man that his motives in seeking Christ were selfish, or it showed the character of his motives, did it not? Character of his motives. In other words, that man has shown his sin as a sin actually was. What a blessing. But what power was required to do that is vacillating faith appeared to him in his true character. In deep distress, he realized that the death might cost the life of his son. So far then, before I go any further, let me stress again the point that that man that day received a revelation 
to himself, of himself. He saw his sin as a sin he was, and as the fruit of the ministry of power uh, on the part of Jesus Christ, it shows how powerful was the word of God was in him. Wonderful. Tremendous. And when the, when the Holy Spirit falls upon us in the near future, we'll go forth as Jesus did with that same mighty power to bring to men a realization to themselves, of themselves. And that uh, very incident is such a wonderful example, as you say, of the power of the Word of God. And uh, I remember in Acceptable Confession, you made a point that there's two ways in which we come to realize our condition. One is through the ministry of the Word of God, and the other is much more painful, humiliating experience of falling into sin and then seeing making an acceptable confession and going on. And uh, here was a, an example where Jesus, the very word of God, the living word of God, showed that man his error. He instantly made an acceptable confession in that very, you know, which is very clearly shown in his next statement, you know, the faith that is brought forth in the next statement. And instantly the, the exchange was made from sickness to life, from death to life. Right. That's, uh, that's a wonderful <coughs> example there. It's sure is a beautiful story. I love this story very much. Good. Now, so far in this program, we've seen how Christ's power showed that man to himself as he himself was. But now, God never stops there, fortunately, because if God had taken that man that far and left him there, what would have ever taken him? Despair, discouragement, unbelief, desperation, abandonment to sin, he'd have gone away crushed and destroyed. But um, when God shows us shows our sin on the one side, he shows the cure on the other side at the same time. So now read, he knew that he was in the presence of one who could read the thoughts and to whom all things were possible. Right? He knew. This, this was a, a conscious conviction, a realization, a knowledge. Uh, that he, that, that, that he was right then the present one who could uh, read the thoughts and to whom all things were possible. That man absolutely saw the power of God in Jesus Christ that day. That power not to destroy but to heal, not to abandon but to restore, not to condemn but to forgive. He saw it that day himself. And now we read, in agony of supplication, he cried, Sir, come down, ere my child die. How much God changing do we find in this prayer now? I should say, how much God changing effort do we find in this prayer now? None. None. Now, he accepts Christ as Christ was, he accepts Christ way as that way it was, and he said, simply said, Sir, come down, ere my child die. In other words, he said, Lord, you are my only hope. I only hope without you, I have no hope. I'm lost, I'm undone, I'm destitute, I'm, I'm, I'll lose my son. He took hold upon Christ as did Jacob. <clears throat> when resting with the angel, he cried, I will not let you go except you bless me. Now, what, what word describes Jacob's prayer? Importunate, right? What, what word describes this man's prayer? Well, the words I introduced here, we have to, we have to transpose the words from Jacob's experience. Again, important. Personally, very important. In other words, his faith took hold upon Christ as did Jacob. Yeah, the, 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 in Proverbs and Kings, I remember the word again. Uh, it says that uh, his faith reached out and grasped the promises of heaven, and he persevered in prayer until his petitions were answered. So this sort of laying hold upon of grasping, of possessing, and then petitioning until heaven answers is the thought that comes to view in these verses. Like Jacob, he prevailed. The Savior cannot withdraw from the soul that clings to him, pleading in straight need. Go your way, he said, your son to death. Now, just remember that. The Savior cannot withdraw from the soul who clings to him, pleading its great need. Words worth remembering. Now, on the one side, let me say it again, we'll draw the contrast now between two kinds of prayer. When we, when we include in our prayer any thought or effort to change God, that prayer is going to fail. It's sure to fail, but no, not more certain than that. It's certain to fail. It's guaranteed. 
no exceptions whatsoever. On the other hand, the Savior can't withdraw from the side, clings to him, pleading its great need. So we come to Jesus Christ pleading our great need, which means our need to change. Not God's need to change, but our need to change. We cling to Christ, then what are we absolutely assured of? Success. So here's the failure pattern and the success pattern. And we go wrong anymore. We will know because they're humanity, won't we? <laughs> Don't need to know, they need whatsoever. Right? So here we find the man then passing from the from one kind of prayer to another kind of prayer. His first prayer was one desire to change God or Jesus Christ and God in Jesus Christ. The second was to change himself. Thus he passed from defeat and despair to victory and hope. Right? Now does, did this guy then never, never make the same mistake again? Was he proof now against ever falling into the same mistake again? Definitely not, unfortunately. Well, but what I should say, unfortunately, because the fact that we have the opportunity, of course, is our freedom, spiritually speaking, and God doesn't take away that freedom. It gives us the chance, of course, again and again to uh, learn the lesson we should be learning from the beginning. Right. Let's turn to another experience of Christ and his disciples. Yeah. I hate to interrupt, but see how you're changing the story. I just want to uh, ask a question. Go ahead, by all means. You said that uh, the revealed is sin. Is it, in fact, the story meant to reveal our sin? So that's how it is. You say in the story, his sin was revealed, and you quoted and said that the sin was the character of his motive. Okay? Yeah. Okay, it, it just uh, is a question is, is God in the story revealing to us the character of our sin? Or can do, yes. Well, I mean, what I'm saying is, is the sin in praying this kind of prayer the wrong motive? Definitely. Is it, um, is it an easy thing or a hard thing to change one's motive? No. <laughs> Not very easy. Yeah, right. You can't change your own motive. It can be, can be difficult. Um, okay, well, I'm just curious if, if that's what God wants to do is change our motive. Then, um, it seems like he, he would have a method of doing that. Certainly. And... Uh, and uh, it seems like that would be the key to uh, changing that type of prayer. Right. Okay. Okay, okay well then. Getting it root causes. The wrong motive is when we try and change God. It's the wrong motive. Oh, baby. The motive is objective. Right? That's always, that's always wrong to a sin. And to change them, we have to first of all see from the Word of God the nature of that motive. We've got to see in this person. Okay. And when we see for ourselves, any prayer is designed to change God is, is the wrong kind of prayer, not the prayer for the demands of the And let's repent and redesign our prayers. Seems like a, a simple process. Well, relatively well, speaking, it is. You wonder why we never saw it before. <laughs> it, it, it hit me like a runaway logo about that three months ago. issue is concerned what is the real issue in trying to change God is it not assuming the prerogative of the Godhead of being the source and sure. the plan maker and the problem solver and the right. burden bearer that is that is the real the real root of the sin sure yeah. it's always been bad for that to change, to change God to be God in the place of God is the original sin it's basic uh, Babylonianism yeah the mystery of iniquity right we haven't come all the way to Babylon yet. <coughs> Not quite. Very good. Yes, Gina. I saw some points in it that I see. When Elijah prayed, you come out of this way, I believe you can't hear too well. When Elijah prayed and seen a small cloud, that was enough evidence for him. Sister White says he did not wait for full evidence, but he had some evidence. In this man, I see the same thing happen. Did not wait for full evidence, but when he discerned that Christ has every motive and thought, that was enough evidence to grasp the problem, to grasp to the first faith to grow. Is that you know? Sure. Is that right, well, we must act upon the word of God. When you saw the power in the word that he acted. For instance, when you go back to the crossing of the Red Sea, 
walked in, when they put their feet in the water, then the water the field they let them through. And then they just step out by, by faith in the word of God at that point in time. Good point. I just got another story now, what time have we got left? About um, This time I take the story of the feeding of the 5,000, which is around that page 360 or thereabouts. And uh, you'll find the same pattern that's brought to view in this chapter. Page 377. This chapter is called Night on the Lake and is a subsequent experience to the feeding of the 5,000. And I'd like to take the scripture in this regard where it, where it says they plan to take him by force and make him king. You know, you know it quite long throughout the week on the planet. This is John, I think, uh, chapter 6 or Mark chapter 6. Now, during that day, when Christ fed the 5,000, he first of all taught them these wonderful truths in the Word of God. The great parables of the coming kingdom have been taught to them and they have received it with gladness. Now I'd like to emphasize a very important point here and that is this, that very soon we expect the latter rain to fall and then they fight again. In that time of country, we don't have oil in our lamps, what shall happen to us? We'll be lost, right? Now what does the oil in the vessel of the lamp signify? That we have been born again in fact. We need and I'll stress this point later the way again, but we need to be absolutely certain and know for ourselves that we have been in fact born again. <coughs> now, a person who's not born again can love and appreciate the truth. Right? We can admire it by beautiful music or beautiful painting. We can love the truth of God and admire the truth of God and enjoy it. And love the fellowship of those who believe the truth of God as the foolish Christians actually do. We can, like, we can also see great changes made now out of behaviour, out of those those practices, without, without being born again. We can be modified in terms of the old. But, but only that person in whom the presence of Christ has replaced the old presence of sin is in fact a born again Christian. I think that's not satisfying, and I think that's not a of the kingdom. I mention this now because on that day as they like, listen to the word of God, they are thrilled with what they heard. When they they loved the message Christ taught. To them it was a beautiful, powerful, and effective preacher. They loved every word they heard. And their faith grew stronger and stronger as the day went by. But when they, as their faith strengthened, it strengthened in respect to their, their, their taking Christ and using him to fulfill their ambitions and their hopes and aspirations. Let's take page 377. All day the conviction is strengthened. That crowning act is, a, is an assurance that the long look of the amongst them. The hope of the people rise higher and higher. This is he who will make Judea an earthly paradise and land flying with milk and honey. It says by every desire you break the power of the Holy Romans, etc. So those folk had a pattern marked out with Christ a plan. They had worked out how he was to go about fulfilling the promises of God, how he was to go about building up the kingdom and so forth, that they could not see in Christ any disposition to do what they wished him to do, could they? Why not? It wasn't there. It wasn't there. His kingdom building principles were altogether foreign to their kingdom building principles altogether. They uh, planned their kingdom based on force, bloodshed and violence. He on love and peace and, uh, and so forth. So I read in page 378, in their enthusiasm, the people are really crowning, to at once crowning the king. They see that he makes no effort to, to try to be pure of himself. In this, he is essentially different than priests and rulers and so on. Consulting together, they agree to take him by force and become the king of Israel. Now, if ever there is an example, a, a very, very uh, obvious example of men trying to change God, this is it. It's a glaring example, a very, very clear cut, powerful example. They knew he would not voluntarily do it himself. They knew he would not agree to their asking to do it either. And says so that there's only one by them, we must take him by force and make him king against his own will. 
that's the best to do it. And in this plan, the disciples of Christ conspired with Mojitu to carry out that, that objective. And do we find Christ acquiescing in the slightest degree to their plans? No. Not in the least degree. Not in the least degree. So, how much success did their prayer have? Once again, absolutely none. Christ refused their honour, refused their pleas, refused their prayers, and were his own way according to God's plan and purpose instead. My time is about gone, I guess, so I'll round it out at this point. I'll make this more detail a bit later. He sent the disciples away and dispersed the multitude and they went and would not even rejoin the disciples until they had been broken down by the terrible storm to, 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 to him. So in this story we have a very clear cut example of the kind of prayer designed to change God this time in the person of Jesus Christ and a very, very clear picture of the other failure of that prayer to succeed when Christ would not participate in their plans in any sense of word whatsoever. I'll stop at that point. Any thoughts or questions you'd like to ask or add? Yes, Tom. Um, just by thinking and looking at this, uh, this statement about the uh, this little, uh, about the nobleman, the, uh, his motive, or it appears that his motive was to ch- try and change God, but uh, I, it seems like that uh, his motive was even, uh, 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 the base motive was even uh, deeper than that. It says the child was very, very low. And it was fear that he might not live till his return. It seems like that uh, the motive in most of people's prayer, as far as the examples we have in the scriptures, was a deeper motive rather than just them trying to change God's, uh, trying to change uh, God. They do try to change God because of uh, a tremendous fear that they have from him because of a misrepresentation or a mis- misinterpretation of his character. So it seems like that the, the motive is even far, uh, deeper down than just a, uh, it seems that we, we want to change God because we are afraid of him the way he is or the way we perceive him to be. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Yeah. There are various uh, 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 pressures brought to bear upon a person which in the end call them to want to change God. Certainly. Now the wish to change God is very subtle and, and it's not, not easily seen. Because all we can see is our good motive. After all, said, no, this man came to the right person, Jesus Christ. He came asking for the right thing. Okay, so it all looked very, very righteous and acceptable. Because in it was this uh, this position to change God and have God answer his prayer his way. That becomes, of course, very important for the church party. And it's interesting that Christ changed his picture of uh, who God was okay. and, and thereby corrected his motive. All rebellion springs from a misrepresentation of God's character. Amen. All sin. As we said in the book. What book is that? I've heard about it. <laughs> yeah, any other thoughts or questions? Now, before we close, I'd like to make some comments on the Sabbath. Uh, <coughs>
noticed. Message from all of you. 